Welcome to the Psychology of Video Games podcast, where we examine the intersection of psychology and video games. My name is Jamie Madigan. This is episode one about frustration, motivation, rage quitting, and video game violence. Snami Bog. Remember, no Russian. So that was audio from the infamous No Russian mission in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. So during that mission, you play as an undercover CIA agent who has to take part in the slaughter of civilians at a Moscow airport in order to keep from blowing your cover. It's frequently brought up as an example during discussions of the effects on video game violence just because it's so grim and dramatic. Here's another audio clip from Grand Theft Auto V, another popular game that's much more recent. It features one of the protagonists, Trevor, torturing another man by pulling out his tooth with a set of pliers. Hey, hey, please, please. Now, if you open real wide, I might be able to just reach right back there and grab one of those big ones. I just have the blazer. Are they still alive? So, yes, in this edition of the podcast, my guests and I are going to talk some about the psychology around video games and violence, but probably not in the way that you've heard before. We're going to explore another branch of research on the topic besides, does viewing violent content create violent behavior? Before I get to that, though, let's go through a quick primer on where the research on violence in video games stands today. Don't worry, I'll be brief. So, there's no shortage of content on the topic and most of the time it doesn't look good for our hobby. Just back in 2013, some researchers scrubbed through 540 different newspaper articles that were published in the United States and found that 53% of them suggested that simply watching violent media does increase violent behavior in real life. Now, before you start doing the math, that doesn't mean that the other half reported no relationship. The uh, The other most frequent angle was to say that there was no conclusive evidence either way. 38% said that, leaving just 9% of the articles to say that there was no relationship between viewing violent media and subsequent violent behavior. And what's more, seeing this kind of story reported can lead people to think that it's true simply because they've heard it a lot and it's easier to recall from memory uh, than contradictory claims. This is something that's called the familiarity bias, and it happens all the time, but that's a topic for another time. So what about psychologists and other social scientists studying the question? I'm glad you asked. Many of those on the yes, it causes violence side rally under some sort of uh, banner related to social learning theory. In short, they say we can and do learn about how to behave by watching what others do and what happens to them. The most widely cited theory under this banner is called the general aggression model or sometimes the general learning model, formalized by Craig A. Anderson, currently a professor at Iowa State University. So the general aggression model argues that violent media, including violent games, leads to violent thoughts and behaviors through psychological priming. You see somebody stab somebody else in a game, and the associative nature of memory and cognition means that you can generally more easily and more quickly think about concepts related to stabbing, like murder or other types of harm or aggression. So, so far, maybe that's not too surprising. We're just talking about fleeting thoughts here after all. But the general aggression model also argues that activating those knowledge structures also primes what are called mental scripts. And mental scripts are just what they sound like, sets of instructions and guidelines for interpreting a situation and then reacting to it. So violent imagery makes violent scripts easier and faster to activate, the logic goes. Once that happens, an ambiguous or innocuous situation may be seen as something where violence is appropriate or at least acceptable, when otherwise it might not have before. Uh, What's more, the general aggression model holds that repeated activation of those violence-related scripts makes them habitual and automatic. 
Over time, they can even affect changes to more stable mental constructs like personality or lead us to place ourselves in situations where violence is acceptable and expected. It's kind of an oversimplification, but you get the idea. So the general aggression model and others similar to it have often been tested by having one group of people play a violent game while another group of people play as a nonviolent game. Then researchers use various techniques to see how quickly and easily violent thoughts come to minds of those groups of people. They may ask them to fill in a missing letter to complete a word uh, like E-X-P-L-O blank E and then see who comes up with explode and who comes up with explore. Or they might see to what degree people engage in, and I'm going to make finger quotes here, violent behaviors or aggressive behaviors. And we're talking about stuff like blasting other people with white noise, dumping hot sauce on their snacks, or sabotaging their chances of winning a lottery. So there are plenty of criticisms to this approach and this model, and there are reasons to be skeptical of the results that come out of the research on it or how far those results can be applied in the real world. Um, those in the no, it does not cause the violent behavior camp are happy to explain them. I don't want to go down that hole, but I'll link to some of the better summaries on the blog post for the podcast on psychologygames.com. But here's the thing. I think it's largely beside the point, or at least I think there's a whole other set of points out there to be gotten as well. Though it's clearly used to study video games now, the general aggression model was originally developed to study violence in media like movies and television. Those kinds of media are fundamentally different from video games. Playing a game today involves adopting goals, understanding systems, interacting with other human beings, spending social capital like reputation and pride, wrestling with controllers and other user interfaces, seeking and getting feedback, making choices, forming relationships, experimentation, and so many other things that never come into play when watching movies, reading comics, or sitting down with a TV show. The experiences you get playing any two games can be far more different than the ones you would get from watching any two movies or cartoons, for example. Given that, does it make sense to directly compare aggression levels between someone who plays The Sims and somebody who plays Call of Duty? Or might the myriad of differences between those two experiences somehow affect those people's moods independent of how much blood is on the screen? So, you know, may there be things about those experiences and those games and those systems that create violence, inhibit violence? Are there some sort of interactions? By and large, the researchers don't really take this into account. And a lot of what I've seen on the topic suggests a dim understanding of the nature of video games relative to other media. Today, my guest is Dr. Andrew Shabilsky from the University of Oxford. He, along with some of his co-authors, recently published a paper describing a line of research that does take what I think is a more complete view of video games and investigates more nuanced ways that they can affect aggression and our moods in general. And so, on to the interview. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're here again, like I said, to talk about some issues related to violence in video games, rage quitting, frustration, and associated topics. And my guest on this edition of the podcast is, uh, and let me make sure I got this name right. It's Andy. Is that, is that correct? Uh -huh. Andy. Okay. Yeah. A Andy Shabilsky. And uh, Andy's at Oxford University, where he's a, a researcher, a professor there. And you, if you've read the website, you might have seen his name come up uh, several different places because I've referenced a lot of the work that he and his colleagues have done. And if you're ever interested in Googling it, it's uh, Shabilsky spelled P-R-Z-Y-B-Y-L-S-K-I. Um, so, Andy, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. So, so let's start off just kind of by talk to me a little bit about where you are, who the heck you are, and and what you're doing. Uh, sure thing. So, um, I'm an experimental psychologist and a research fellow at a institute at the University of Oxford uh, called the Oxford Internet Institute, and this is a multidisciplinary uh, center or department um, who kind of study aspects of of life and technology. Um, in on life's, uh, online spaces. Um, and as, as, as part of that agreement, I study um, online and offline contexts uh, 
through a motivational and psychological lens. Okay. And the motivational lens seems to be at least where I'm familiar with a lot of the work you've done, um, like with, uh, I guess, Edward DC and uh, Scott Rigby and, and Richard Ryan, a lot of those guys around self-determination theory. Uh, um, yes, abso- yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm first and foremost a, a student and researcher um, in the area of human motivation um, and, and why people do what the things they do. And one of the things that we do is play video games. So it seems like a lot of the research has gone towards sort of a motivational slant of, of answering a question that I get a lot, which is just, you know, why, why do people play games? And one of the, the questions that's come up with that that I kind of want to start off posing to you is violent games in particular. You know, can you kind of walk me through, walk me through why those are appealing, maybe with sort of an eye towards self-determination theory and how that explains? Uh, absolutely. So there, there are two basic ways that you can think about the motivational appeal of violent video games. Um, the first is almost a, a Freudian perspective. Um, the idea is that human beings are drawn to themes of, you know, sex and death. Um, and the second is, uh, you know, the, the, the first having to do with the content of a violent video game. Um, and the second, uh, a more motivational, a more empirical psychology perspective um, would be concerned with the structure of the video game. Um, not necessarily the violence per se, but the kinds of games that violence tends to go along with. Um, so uh, uh, understanding this, actually, um, my colleagues and I have done two sets of studies, um, one that looks at the former, the kind of individuals who might be drawn um, to uh, violence in games and the effects of kind of turning up and down the violence knob uh, on, on human motivation. And then I, I think the, the paper that we're talking about more today um, with, a, with a greater focus on game structure and kind of the things that turn people on and turn people off um, and potentially make them quite aggressive. Um, in both the presence or the absence of violence. So on the one hand, you've kind of got the, the content of the game, you know, the violent content. And on the other hand, you've got sort of characteristics of the game in terms of, I guess, a, a large number of possible different things, but all, you know, structure and, and mechanics and controls and, and all those other things that may affect how motivated we are to play games and how aggressive we might get as a result of playing games that may be violent or maybe not. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is really what drew our interest into the idea of studying kind of anything having to do with player aggression, which is that my colleagues and I have been very interested in kind of what drives immersion, what drives fun, what drives engagement, what drives, you know, what what psychologists would call an intrinsic motivation. Um, and we found, you know, one of the things that was important was to look at mood, <laughs> kind of how positively or negatively people were feeling. And we found that when, yeah, exactly. And so one of, one of the big, uh, uh, icebergs of mood, um, is hostility. It is aggressive feelings. And for a few years, basically what we were finding was that kind of the, the games that really motivated people kind of chilled them out or got them excited. Um, but it certainly didn't tick them off. Yeah. Okay. So. It, it seems to me like there's sort of an underserved, uh, or that highlights an underserved aspect of the, the literature on violent games. Most of it has been about just sort of, you know, how much red is on the screen, how many people get shot, you know, how violent the, the content is. But video games are a lot more complex, and they're, they're interactive, and they involve other people, and they involve systems and all these other things that we haven't necessarily seen a lot of research on of what the interactions might be with with violent media or, or, or violent content or not. So your most recent paper in the Journal of uh, Personality, and I think it's your most recent, but the one in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology um, that we're going to talk about today sort of took that to heart and addressed at least one aspect or, or two aspects of that, specifically around blocking players from feeling competent or making them feel incompetent in the game, and then what sort of things that triggered in terms of hostility and frustration and aggression. Yeah, exactly right. So kind of our aim was, if you, if you think of this um, structural aspect of where aggression might come from and this content aspect of where aggression might come from, kind of our aim in designing and running these experiments was to kind of systematically manipulate these things um, individually uh, uh, and separately, sometimes together, but many times apart, mm-hmm. um, because we kind of wanted to get a sense of, you know, how much of this might be coming down to uh, questionable research designs that many gamers would kind of throw their arms up at seeing, uh, and how much of it was uh, uh, coming down to content per se. Okay. So walk us through through the study. I, I know there's actually like, what, seven or eight different 
experiments oh, that you're boy. Yeah. Yes, there, there are at least eight experiments. Um, and, and the process of peer review often means that many well, well designed studies fall by the wayside. I um, see when you it started comes off time. with more even. Uh, yes, uh, a, a, a good number more. Um, but, but we were told that they were an excessive number of experiments. Um, but, not but, a bad but I, problem to have. Uh, really. Not, not, not a bad problem. But, but essentially, um, the the research program started with us attempting to replicate, which is to say, run again, um, a very um, popular study, uh, which is to say, academics cited it a bunch of times, uh, that was done in the early two thousands. Um, that kind of looked at the effects of um, uh, game content on p- feelings of player aggressiveness. And um, really what we were doing was we wanted to look at this both through the lens of content and through the lens of motivation. Okay. So what were some of the highlights from the study? What were you know, some of the experiments you did and, and what did you find? Well, we found that actually um, a widely used practice um, using games, separate games to represent high versus low violence play um, this is kind of business as usual uh, among many researchers, um, that this might introduce uh, a confound, which is to say that when you're changing the content of a violent game um, by using, you know, Grand Theft Auto versus Tetris, um, you might also be, be changing the structure of a game, mm-hmm. uh, a game being a very complex open world uh, uh, simulation versus uh, a game that is uh, involves two-dimensional puzzle pieces. So a confound is essentially like an alternative explanation for what you find. Um, a confound isn't necessarily an alternate explanation. What it is, is an accidental manipulation. So the idea in an experiment is that you manipulate one thing and one thing only. But one of the things that our studies show is that using two different games might be a very bad idea. Because when you use two different games to represent high versus low con- violent content, you might also be changing other very important motivational aspects of the game. So the example that you had in the paper was the that classic study that you reproduced where one game was some little game where you're flying a paper airplane and you just use two keys on the keyboard to make it go up or down. And the other one was, was the first person shooter marathon two, where you use like, I guess, 20 something keys to control a complex, an avatar moving through a complex 3d environment and aiming and shooting. So one, one was violent, one was not, but there were other differences as well. Yeah, there were a wide variety of differences. And so kind of it, for viewing, viewing this study through a, a motivational lens, which if we were trying to figure out something about immersion, and we would immediately look at this comparison and say, you know, these games are motivationally quite different. Marathon 2 is a precursor to Halo. Uh, it's a lo- lovely, lovely game done by Bungie. And they, um, they really designed the game for older people who were experienced with, you know, PC, uh, uh, based shooters. And so it takes a lot of time to learn how to play Marathon 2. Um, whereas, uh, the game Glider Pro 2, uh, Glider Pro 4, sorry, is, um, absolutely a casual game. In fact, I think it's currently some version of it is in the Mac App Store, um, under casual. It's gotta be, yeah. Yes. Yeah, at this point. Okay. So, so when you started manipulating or I guess maybe holding constant and then manipulating other things, what did you find? Right. So the, the, the approach we took, and you have to remember that these studies were done over the course of a number of years, um, is, uh, we started manipulating the Half-Life 2 engine using Gary's mod. And what we, what we tried to do was only change how violent the story was and how much kind of blood and gore there was on the screen and kind of look at, you know, how opportunities for practicing and how opportunities for kind of getting better at gameplay kind of uh, interacted with feelings of hostility and then what kinds of effects did violent content have. So we found that violent, when we made the game more violent, perhaps unsurprisingly, people felt more threatened when they played. They felt kind of like more tense, (laughs) Um, but they didn't necessarily feel um, more hostile emotions. Um, what we did find, though, was when people were not given the opportunity to practice playing first-person shooters, these were all people who had never played first-person shooters before, um, they tended to get pretty angry in the lab uh, and pretty frustrated um, if they weren't given the opportunity to kind of, you know, build their first-person shooter skills up uh, beforehand. Okay. So it was a difference in, I guess, skill or ability that was leading them to become frustrated, independent of the violent content. Yeah, and so and so the th- the thing to really hold in your mind here is that a number of these experiments that are done um, on on video games um, in labs 
Um, they involve uh, undergraduates, either communication students, HCI students, or psychology students, many of whom have never played video games before. Uh, this is increasingly not the case. You know, there'll be many more casual game players, but very few of them um, have used WASD to move around a 3D environment along with a mouse. And so, you know, you, you have to keep in mind that many of these participants um, aren't your typical uh, gamer. Yeah. Okay. So, and and you found that the violence didn't necessarily matter, right? Or the violent content didn't necessarily matter. Uh, this was something. So, so across a number of our studies, I think uh, across the eight or nine studies, there were six opportunities for violent content to kind of show an effect on on mood. Um, and we were really surprised. Besides um, feeling threatened or feeling unsafe, um, we weren't able to find any consistent effect for the manipulation of just violence on aggression. We were able to find that when a game was, you know, more violent and also more difficult to play, um, people kind of got ticked off. <laughs> um, but but we weren't able, we, we, we didn't find um, when violence was the only factor we manipulated um, any effect. Hmm. Okay. So what happened when you mani did manipulate how frustrated people got or, or how incompetent they felt? Um, well, we did this a number of ways, um, but we w one way that we did it was we had players play different versions of, of falling brick games, so different versions of Tetris, essentially. Um, and we found that people um, both said they felt pretty angry <laughs> uh, using questionnaires um, uh, after playing versions of the game that kind of uh, uh, made them work very hard to use the controller. Um, we found we used a we used an adaptive version of Tetris that actually gave people the worst possible pieces. Um, and from that, we found um, that uh, participants actually wanted to assign more pain uh, to their peers uh, after playing. Yeah, I think you're kind of burying the lead. This is actually my favorite parts of the paper is where you, you, you tweaked Tetris in order to enrage people. So uh, just one way you did that was, was messing with the controller so that it did very counterintuitive, non-natural things like... You would have to press a button to rotate left, but a trigger to rotate right or, or something along those yeah. lines. And here, here, let me, let me unbury it. So, you know, essentially when we were talking about player competence, what we were trying to do was look at either how individual differences and kind of how good people were at playing the games, uh, what kind of effect that had on aggression. But we were also very interested in how giving people opportunities to practice, giving people impossible to use controller uh, uh, gameplay controls. So, you know, up would be down, left would be trigger two. You know, it, it was properly infuriating to play. And then we also uh, actually changed the algorithm that Tetris uses to kind of hand out the pieces. So if you absolutely needed a two by two block, 78% of the time it gave you a four by one. Um, and so we really tried in a lot of ways to kind of create scenarios that no matter how kind of inherently good you were at a game, it kind of actively thwarted this sense of competence. I was just going to say, in a way, you're kind of holding skill constant by making it matter less. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we were definitely trying to hold skill constant, which is to say, hold individual differences in skill constant. So you could come in the door, either a, te a Tetris prodigy or a video game prodigy, or, or, or come in having never played before, and in one condition, you would be reduced to angry tears. Um, and in the other condition, um, you'd have a brilliant time. I just love the idea of somebody being reduced to angry tears by Tetris. <laughs> it just sort of seems like the most, you know, innocuous game to do that with. So Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to send you a link. <laughs> I, I, pro I promise you that that version of Tetris gets old after about 30 seconds. Yeah. So what did you find there? Um, well, we found that uh, individuals who play, um, who either don't have a chance to really practice or who play versions of the game that actively thwart them, um, they're more likely to think angry things. Um, they're more likely to say they feel kind of ticked off and angry. Uh, and, and they're more likely to assign um, pain to uh, other participants. So let's talk a little bit about the measures that you use for those sorts of things. You did like a before and after measures of, I guess, like state hostility or, or how mm -hmm. angry they were. So you yeah. were able to measure like the change that playing the game had on them, at least on that. Yeah. So in terms of mood, if you can imagine a very long kind of checklist of emotion words uh, that has like 60 or so emotion words, 
um, of them, four had anything to do with feeling uh, hostile, right? Okay. Um, and so the idea was hidden among all of these possible mood words are these few about hostility. Uh, and we looked at kind of the change that people went under during their time playing the video game. So did, did some people go up? Some people go down. Did some people stay the same? We find that when people play, we found in previous research that when people play kind of very, have very rewarding experiences of gameplay, um, their levels of aggression tend to go down and their levels of positive emotion tend to go up. Um, so that was kind of an off the shelf thing for us. Um, the second way we do it is we, we, we talk about hostile feelings or aggressive, uh, sorry, hostile thoughts or, or aggressive thoughts. And so for that, what we did was we had a computer task. Um, where kind of people were sitting in front of the computer and they had to hit the space bar um, when a real word popped up on the screen. All right. So three possible things could pop up on the screen, either a real English word, a fake word generated by a computer that would be a plausible word like gnut or something, G-N-U-T, um, or uh, a, a English word that uh, had something to do with aggression. So like anger, let's say. And so the idea here was that if it was a fake word, the participant was to do nothing. A fake English word, uh, the participant did nothing. But if it was a real word, they were supposed to read it and hit the space bar as quickly as they could. Um, and so, you know, some participants, if you're feeling angry or you're thinking angry thoughts, you can actually identify the, ang the, the hostility related word a, a tiny bit faster. And by tiny bit, I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, 100 milliseconds or something like that. Um, so that's how we uh, assessed um, kind of aggressive thoughts, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, it um, does. It, it's kind of one of the cornerstones of this type of research. The idea is that because of the associative nature of memory and cognition, that if, if you're feeling angry, then you're more likely or, and to think of angry things or recognize them quicker. Yeah. They, they come more easily to mind. Yeah, and but this, and I just want to say here that this doesn't necessarily mean that I think or my colleagues think that if you play Tetris and have a bad game, um, you'll go on to you know do something in the real world once you leave the lab. Um, we collected these measures, you know, minutes after they played Tetris, and so I think that a lot of people have frustrations in their day to day lives that that blow over quite quickly. Um, we would live in a very very um, unpleasant society. Um, if these kinds of cognitive things didn't kind of blow over very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I would hypothesize that even if you did the measure five minutes later, um, you probably wouldn't get the result. Okay. And then, sorry, uh, go on. Were those the measures? You, I think you mentioned something else about their willingness to assign pain. Yeah. So we had participants come into the lab as a, as a kind of um, uh, as an experimental manipulation or sorry, as an experimental uh, assessment of aggression. What we had participants do is we had participants come into the lab and they all put their hand in, in ice cold water. I think it was four degrees Celsius um, for 25 seconds. And um, they were told um, that, you know, um, the participant before them had picked 25 seconds as the amount of time that they should put their hand in the cold water for. Uh, and then we had them do the study. And uh, before they left, we asked them, uh, how long should the next participant put their hand in the cold water for? The idea here was that everyone um, had their hand in the cold water for 25 seconds, um, but only some participants would assign more or less time than they themselves experienced. Got it. And I guess the idea was that if they're angry or, or feeling hostile, they might say 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, no one, no one said 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> But, but if, if, if memory serves, um, people who, um, played the version of Tetris that actively thwarted their sense of competence, um, they tended to assign seven more seconds of, um, very cold water hand immersion. Right. Okay. So let's, let's kind of circle back around to the whole frustration angle to this research and, and, and sort of, sort of summarize what you found there and what conclusions you think you can draw. All right. Um, well, I think that the, the, the main conclusion that can be drawn is that, um, you know, motivational theory has, has postulated that um, when you have your basic psychological, psychological needs satisfied, so when you feel kind of connected to other human beings, when you feel a choice and uh, when you feel a sense of choice and volition, um, and when you feel confident and effective, 
um, you tend to do better. <laughs> you're, you have better mental, uh, me- mental health, better well-being over time. You're, you're happier. Um, this, this research kind of speaks to the darker side of that. What happens when the wheels come off the wagon? Um, so I have colleagues who have studied kind of social isolation and kind of the deprivation of choice. Um, I think that this research kind of is, is one of the first steps to really comprehensively look at how short-term kind of deficits in feeling competent um, might really be a source, of, at least of short-term aggressiveness. So, yeah, you, you alluded to this earlier. You guys are, didn't necessarily set out to test whether or not violent content does anything one way or another. Uh, it was more about the frustration and sort of eliminating people's ability to feel competent at, at something. Yeah, th- this is this is absolutely right. So these these studies weren't were absolutely not designed in order to kind of debunk the idea that the violence in games has effects on people. These studies were designed to ensure uh, a, a kind of a very stringent uh, scientific test of the idea that frustration. Uh, the, the, that on the upside, competence support makes games really fun and really engaging. And on the downside, frustration of competence kind of drives disengagement and negative feelings and aggressive feelings. Um, it was very surprising to us that we found no effects for violent content, um, except, again, for participants feeling kind of uh, threatened or, or a sense of disease. So what... What do you think this suggests or, or what, you know, suggestions do you think this makes as far as antidotes for uh, violent games? Like, you know, what sort of things could it, somebody designing a game or, or somebody designing a community and managing community around a game do with this research? My sense of, of what this means is that kind of suffering a crushing defeat, you know, not making that necessarily reducing if possible, <laughs> uh, softening the blow of a crushing defeat kind of with information that would help a player kind of gain a, regain a sense of competence. So it's not as, it's, it's not enough to know you lost. All right. Um, if you're just, if you just feel terrible about your performance, um, that might be a recipe for feeling incompetent and kind of ticked off. But if you're provided with kind of a useful, you know, post game carnage report, um, that you can learn from and you can derive a sense of competence from, you know, learning from your failure instead of being a failure. Um, I think absolutely that would have an ameliorating effect. Yeah, it sort of ties back into some of the things I've thought about on social comparisons where, you know, you may lose the match or your, your team may lose the match. But if you can give people some feedback about how they stand relative to other people and that feedback is something that makes them feel good. Like, you know, y- your team lost, but hey, you were the most valuable player on your on the losing team. That might still make you feel competent. It just might make you think that the rest of your team is a, a bunch of yeah. scrubs. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, yeah, that's entirely possible. I, w- I would say that the kind of from a from a community design perspective, the most important thing to do is to make kind of a, f- a point of failure um, be about the performance and not about the performer. So it, it's, it's very easy to learn, you know, why someone did a bad job at something or why someone kind of, or how someone messed up, you know, a capture the flag scenario. Um, and it's easy, it's much, it's much easier to learn from that than to just receive the feedback, you were the least valuable player, <laughs> right? <laughs> if that makes sense. And so kind of building in community features that even in defeat can provide useful information uh, about the performance per se. And specifically information, right, like you said, about their performance, about their competence. Yeah. So, for instance, your grenade throws were amazing. Even, even the, the most poorly playing player, uh, the most poorly performing player in, let's say, uh, a Halo 4 deathmatch, right? Um, to, to not just be told that you have the lowest number of kills and the highest number of deaths, that's kind of useless feedback in a lot of ways, and that you were on the losing team. But also to say, you know, your grenade throws were amazing. But your, uh, you know, you went for too many headshots, like like that that kind of feedback that someone can take away from an experience um, will probably lead them to um, fewer rage quits. Yeah. So I was going to ask about rage quit. I think we've all, or you know, most of the people listening to this podcast anyway have have at least felt tempted to rage quit out of a game. You know, when you're on a team and it just seems that your you know your team 
can't do anything right. They can't keep the other team off the capture point or, uh-huh. or, you know, out of the zone or whatever it is that, you know, you may be performing well, but you, you're frustrated with your ability to, to win the match because of something outside of your control, you know, other players. Uh, do you think that the research that, you know, we've talked about here relates to that, to, you know, to the concept of rage quitting in general? Yeah, I don't know. Well, there's two kinds of rage quitting, right? There's there's rage quitting kind of on the individual level, and there's rage quitting kind of on the team level. So you can you can rage quit because someone's like spawn camping you, uh, and it's kind of like an individual thing. Um, or you can rage quit just because you have unrealistic expectations about your team, um, or 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 realistic expectations that are just not being met. Um, I I think that the findings definitely speak to the to the former. I think that if you are individually feeling this kind of, and it's on your shoulders, um, kind of understanding, you know, understanding where your feelings are coming from is, is probably pretty key. Um, uh, uh, on the team based level, um, that, that's kind of interesting. That's that, 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 that probably brings into research that's never been done before about team and identity. Um, I, I, I would be very suspicious of someone who f- frequently found themselves disappointed in the performance of their teammates. Um, I think there, there, there might be something going on there that has absolutely nothing to do with video games. Yeah, the, the common the common thread across all of those situations is that person. <laughs> yes, so. I, I have I've I've played enough World of Warcraft to to know that kind of person. Yeah. All right, so it, it just sort of seemed like a natural analogy to the to the idea of being frustrated with controls. It's yeah, or or the way that the game is responding to controls is outside of of your you know ability and independent of your competence uh, in the game. Yeah, but but think about that just for a moment, kind of what, what that says. So, like, I definitely understand what happens if you're playing Mario, if you're if you're playing one of the like the new Super Mario Brothers game, and like for whatever reason there's input lag, right? Like the the, the person you blame is the game designer or the hardware. Right. Like like there's something wrong with the system, but there's something kind of really interesting about you blaming another human being for letting you down. Right. That, that requires a certain level of objectification to say, like, you person have like a mechanism failed me. Yeah. Like that's I don't know. That, 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 that's a really complicated research question. You are not a person. You are a gameplay mechanic. Yeah. You you are my gameplay mechanic. Yeah. yeah. If, if I well, I believe an increasing number of game developers are probably depending on co-play to be a mechanic in of itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It just, you know, kind of getting back to the idea of, like, there are all these other aspects of of games that set them apart from television and movies and comic books and other media that have been studied in the context of violence, where you're playing games, you're interacting with other people, you're interacting with complex systems, you're wrestling with controllers, and it's it's a lot more complicated than watching... A TV show or a cartoon or, or something like that. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right that, that it may be more complicated um, than other forms of media. But I would actually argue that it, this might not be a, a difference of degree. This might be a, a difference of type. So I, I think in many ways, video games might have more in common with other kinds of games and other kinds of play than they do in common with other forms of media, if that makes sense. So I think that probably playing Lego... Or, or playing Settlers of Catan or, or playing, you know, American football are more similar to Halo um, than watching Kill Bill. So has there been research that, you know, in like looking at how kids play on a playground or, or play together or, or adults for that matter and, and what types of activities may result in more or less aggression? I don't know. Actually, um, I, I, I would say that motivational in, in terms of motivation research, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and, and in that way, um, the research that my colleagues and I do line up very nicely with studies of elite athletes and, and kind of the kinds of things that make a workplace motivating are also the kinds of things that, you know, our research show, um, make video games motivating. Um, and so really that's the, if there is a value to this basic science research, um, it's that it kind of treats video games and uh, as a, a context like any other interactive context. It really has very little to do with media per se. 
Okay, great. Well, I think we could keep talking about this topic for hours probably, and there's all sorts of tangents we could follow. But uh, I think that's probably a, a pretty good point to at least wrap up the discussion of, of the study and, and the topic. Brilliant. Uh, so I, I very much thank you uh, for your time and your expertise. And before we go, though, I got just a, a few little fun questions for the end of the podcast um, that I'll, I just kind of want to go through with each one of my guests. Um, first one is, uh, you've been playing anything lately? I have been attempting to play Halo Master Chief Collection oh, good online. Luck. Good luck. And I, I have discovered that that game is um, impossible to play online. Um, but no, um, in, in, in all seriousness, I, I, I've been playing with my, with my younger brother um, the Microsoft remake of Age of Empires 2. Yeah, the, the, the HD version, because at some point they did, they did some bug stopping. And the game plays acceptably quickly and doesn't drop it too much. Yeah, I played a lot of Age of Empires one and two back in the day. How does it hold up? Uh, it it holds up fairly well on on my gaming PC. It's a I have a 1080 by you know whatever screen, and uh, it looks just fine. Cool. So second question: what what research you've been working on? What do you got coming up? Um, I'm trying to zoom out. So uh, uh, there are a few lines of work. Um, one line of work has to do with how people see video games in society more broadly and how we make decisions about the kinds of effects that we think games have on people. Um, so that's one line of work. Um, another line of work is trying to look at kind of the population level effects of games on young people, kind of trying to look at not, you know, a hundred kids here or a hundred kids there, but thousands and tens of thousands of young people. Um, and then my third line of work is um, uh, colleagues, clinical psychologists, colleagues, and I are really beginning the process of digging into the idea of um, video game addiction. Oh. What is it? How do you measure it? How long does it last for? What causes it? And what effects does it have? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an important question. And it's kind of one of the other ones that I haven't really dived into because there seems to be an awful lot there. Well, stay stay tuned. There, well, I can tell you there are, that there are at least two hundred and sixty articles on the topic. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt uh, it. But but um, but but how many of them are high quality is is for open for debate. Sure. Um, okay. So, last question is, you know, if if somebody were interested in what we've talked about today, or even if they weren't but wanted to find out more about you, you know, where where's the best place to go on the internet to find out more about you? Um, they are they are free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, it is my name phonetically. Uh, Shaw Bill Ski, S H U H B I L L S K E E. Um, and then once you have that, you can find my Google Scholar, and um, I'm sure they can find you. Uh, they can find me through you, Jamie. Okay. Well, thanks. I very much appreciate it again, as I said, your time, and it was a very interesting discussion, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Great. Um, can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Which you, can, you can cut back in, which is to say that um, my institute. My research institute is a place where people do master's degrees um, and PhDs, uh, and they study um, a wide range of interactive media, things like the internet and social media and video games, um, increasingly with me. Um, and I would uh, invite anyone to check out the Oxford Internet Institute um, if they're looking to study the effects of and, and the societal and individual effects of the internet and things like video games. Okay. And just Google that term and you think they'd find it? Oxford Internet Institute. I promise it's the first hit. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, thanks again and take care and we'll be in touch. So thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a bit of an experiment for me, and I'm interested to hear what you think and what topics you'd like to hear about next. I plan on producing more podcasts in the future, so you can contact me at psychologyofgames.com in a number of ways, or you can write me directly at podcast at psychologyofgames.com. You can also go to that website to find out how to follow me via Twitter, Facebook, and RSS. And of course, at this point, I'll make the standard podcast plea. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or other podcast manager of your choice. And while you're there, give me the rating that you think I deserve. Thanks so much, and I will see you next time.